Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 25th installment of Encyclopedia Hermetica, a big history. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Philip II and his son Alexander. And uh, with me I have Mitch and Brett. Um, <laughs> so hello, gentlemen. Hello. hello. Um, and uh, they are going to be helping us navigate through the morass that is the uh, Alexandrian age. That fourth century. Yeah. So, uh, Mitch, um, would you like to start by telling us what the sources that we have that, that we are going to work with? Uh, well, the root source for a lot of everything we have on the fourth century is based on Hieronymus of Cardia. Um, he was a contemporary to Alexander. Um, he actually accompanied the campaigns and he was involved a lot actually with the successors during the period of transition after Alexander's death. Um, so that's where we find sources uh, such as Justin or um, Curtius getting their information from indirectly or directly. Uh, we don't actually have anything left of Hieronymus of Cardia. It's all lost, so... So it's all fragmentary and we have it through citations yeah. from other authors. We can yeah. see in stuff like, um, for example, there's a speech in both Justin and Plutarch with Eumenes of Cardia. Yeah. And they are very similar, except for one is, like, the Justin speech is more elaborated. But it introduces a uh, uh, themes that don't get resolved, so mm -hmm. we can tell from that that they both drew their speeches from his source independently. Yeah, and we and see that through, uh, you know, other authors like Diodorus as well, who are yeah. You, you trace the similar elements that couldn't have, you know, from made up shown from up somewhere independently else. Yeah. or been influenced directly by each other. And that's how we know the accounts are, if not working from a common source that worked from Hieronymus, working from Hieronymus itself. Uh, I don't know when it was lost. Yeah, uh, they, um, they might have had access to it still. I mean, we're talking about for someone like... Well, well Justin's not using... Justin's using Trogus, which is using... Um, a, a Trogus would have been using many sources. Yeah, so for this period, though, because Hieronymus was the authority... Okay, um, by the way, we should just specify that... Justin is a historian from about 200 A.D. Or do you do A.D. or C.E.? I do A.D. That, oh, yeah. That classification is debatable, too. But, yeah, but he's from about 200 A.D. Um, Trogus uh, flourished... He would have been writing a little after Livy, so probably first book 10 B.C. Uh, to about 10 to 15 A.D. We have some silence concerning some deaths of the uh, uh, royal family, so that tells us that he, he was probably not aware of them concerning some peoples. Um, so Trogus was writing about 200 years earlier, and Eumenes of, I mean, Hieronymus of Cardia would have been writing from, what? He would have been writing during the 4th yeah, century. So like 320 um, to 300. He lasted in his life at least until the death of, well, probably at least Ipsus. Um, I'm not sure his actual date of death. Is three or three? Uh, three or one. All right. Uh, he was he was there, so he was friends at different times with two of the different people contending during the period of transition. So all right, I think a, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Though. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. But the the point is, uh, Hieronymus was very much a contemporary to late Alexander, at least. Right. Um, so we have that source primarily. Uh, we get a lot of information also from Plutarch. Uh, yeah the biographer of the second century AD, who has his lives, so we get a lot of information through that. What about the Ptolemaic propaganda? Uh, we also have Ptolemy, um, his history, uh, and like any source... It's a lost source. It, it's a lost source as well. Um, even yeah, we if had. we had it, it would be... I mean, if you've seen the Alexander movie, <laughs> it's completely from the perspective of Ptolemy, but... Uh, yeah. I mean, what can you say, really, about a man so ambitious that he took an empire for himself, what would he say about the others, so, um, yeah, everything with a grain of salt, as usual. Of course. Um, but those are some of our sources, there are more. Okay, there are, yeah, biographers. Yeah. The Anabasis. Um, uh, the Anabasis is too early for this the is the, No, the Anabasis yeah. of Alexander, who oh. was that? Oh, Arian. Yeah, and Arian. Arian, uh, we've lost a lot of Arian. But, is uh, he... But 
He's uh is he a, he's not an original, he's a later. Arian is a I want to say second century author as well. Sec and we also BC AD Appian. I think Arian's second BC. I'm not sure. Because Appian is AD. I, I know Appian's AD. Uh, I'm not sure about Arian. I believe he's a second century BC. Yeah. Um, so he, this is already even our fre even our compilers are people who just worked on the original source are now just yeah right so yeah. the guys we get are like third time removed indirect right and going into after Alexander almost every source we have is going to be not even in like sometimes one account in one historian is the best you can hope for it's tough after it, Alexander picking through the sources uh, for this period and then especially moving down into the Hellenistic age is. Uh, trickier and trickier because of the, the type it's of source like they use, how they use One sources. of the most prolific literary periods in in antiquity, and so many things just died in the manuscript tradition because it was written off as not as worthy as these yeah. archetypes that were set in the classical era. So, I, so, so much. I think the sum of the point is a lot of what we know about this period isn't firm. Some of it we can say with a certain amount of certainty because of how often it shows yes. up in sources. And uh, what what it's backed by uh, in our archaeological records, those sorts of things. But like I said, everything with a grain of salt. A, a lot of this stuff we're fairly sure about. Alexander, like Alexander and Philip, were fairly strong on. Yes. But um, after that, this snowballs into some murkiness. Mm -hmm. Right. A, a diplomatic nightmare maze that is the Hel Hellenistic world. Yes, and yeah. the sources that cover it, we have so many that so many things that reference them and acknowledge them and quote them, but the sources produced in this time just are gone. Weren't worth copying. Didn't pertain to no, it's uh, not even the that salvation of the immortal soul. Well, that's that's more the West. Like, the East did these things too. They were a little better with their literature. But the problem is uh, there was just some idea of what the... Uh, like the archetypical uh, type of tragedy or poem should look like. And these really wonderful things of the Hellenistic era, which are far more intelligent and cerebral, which you don't get in Homer and 5th century rather nationalistic stuff of Athens, all of it just was discarded as not fitting as the ideal. Right. All right, so, I mean, we could start with, um, with Macedonia itself. I mean, it's just a quick general history. Because, I mean, where we have to go back isn't that far. Macedonia was never really a huge thing until I hear some Philip. people say Macedon. What's the difference? Uh, it, it's interchangeable. One I've heard used specifically for the geographical region and one for the state. Macedon and then Macedonia. I, I mean, I'll switch back and forth. I'm bad for it. They both mean the same thing to me. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Macedon. Yeah, that's all it is. I was um, just trying to clarify that for someone listening. Yeah. A lot... A lot uh, I think the English tradition tends to say Macedon. More. Macedon, yeah, okay. Well, I'll try to stick to Macedon. I, I prefer Macedonia. Uh, the reason it's Macedon, by the way, is it's just that's how the French showed yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Um, and then it was Maced Macedonia in Latin. I, okay, so, well, anyway, we, we go back. Macedonia uh, was never a huge deal uh, until Philip. Philip was the one who expanded it so greatly. Uh, they did have roles to play uh, during the Persian Wars. Uh, they'd been accused of being Medizers because of the way they actually helped uh, the Persians invade Greece with the Vale of Tempe during the Persian Wars in the early 5th century. Uh, Macedon had always been in the north, a small country uh, near the sea, not too much going on. And very foresty. Very foresty. Uh, and they, they were connected to the Thracian supplies. Uh, they had a lot of the same, the Amphipolis area, so a lot of lumber... Uh, they would come into a lot of mining they, eventually under Philip. They weren't politically united, though, were they? No. We had the Lower and the Upper Macedonians. So the Upper Macedonians living on the mountains. Uh, they're the crazy mountain hicks. Uh, yeah. The Lower Good Macedonians yeah, were... Red-headed red barbarian types. Yeah. And our, our Lower Macedonians were the horse lords on the plains. Uh, they were the ones who raised horses. They were the family which... Hence the Argyets. name Philip. Yeah. Lover, yeah, of horse. lover of horses. Lover of horses. A good noble name, and if you're trying to ingratiate yourself among Greeks, that's a good way. Just take a Greek name and give yourself a great Greek noble name. Exactly. Because it wouldn't be Phil Philippus is not a Macedonian name. Can't be. <laughs> no, it would be it would be Bill because uh, yeah, it's a PH. Berenike versus Feronike. Hmm. There you are. Um. So it would have to be a Bill name. But that's. 
another discussion. Bill, Father <laughs> Alexander. Bill. <laughs> Doesn't have the ring to it. Billipus. Phil. Um, oh, yeah. So, the Argad household, uh, of which Philip and Alexander were, uh, was of the lower Macedonian houses. Um, the Argead household traced its ancestry back to Heracles, to Hercules. Uh, it's a very complicated mythological story that I'm not going to go into for fear that I've forgotten something about it. Uh, a lot of relations to the Temenids, who were the ruling household of Argos. Uh, a lot of Doric ties as well. Uh, so, I mean, you can look more into they that. They picked the something... genealogy they wanted. Yeah, and then as is tradition. I, I should mention that in modern day, uh, there is a, a, a vigorous tradition of debating over who, what Alexander was ethnically. Was yeah. he Greek or was he Macedonian? And this distinction is, is ridiculous. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it, do, it doesn't matter. It both, right. For all intents and purposes, he, he was... He was Macedonian among Macedon, his Macedonians, yeah. and he needed to be Macedonian among. Alexander was Greek among the Greeks. And then he started to become Persian among the Persians. We're jumping ahead of ourselves right. a bit. <laughs> yeah. I just got a foreshadow. To just to clarify. Why, yeah. why it is that uh, Alexander's family lines are important. Because yeah. people will dig this stuff up. I mean, uh, the theme of interfamiliar strife is something so important in the coming period and this one even I mean uh, as we'll talk about in a second Philip wasn't the natural heir to the throne of Macedon he had to take it all right uh, Philip was born himself uh, in the late 380s uh, his parents were Amintas the second and Eurydice the first uh, both names both dynastic names Eurydice would pop up a lot over the next couple hundred years in the successor kingdoms, uh, but it became one of those power names. You, you give them to people because you want them to be important. Um, Philip was the third born son, I believe, of this two, uh, so he obviously was not going to touch the kingship with a ten-foot pole uh, unless something would happen, and as fate happens, it does, but... Uh, fate always happens. Yeah, of course. When um, hasn't fate happened? <laughs> that's too deep for this guy. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, Philip spent his youth actually as a hostage. Uh, I believe it was to make up for uh, a lot of transgressions they had in the South. Could have been that, or just because. Uh, but Philip. Um, worth looking up because hostages are often given on yeah, perfectly friendly things. Simply a political exchange. Yes, like just, going to a different school for a semester in yeah, France. Yeah, just to show friendship and trust. Uh, but anyway, this is how Philip, Philip ended up in Thebes, uh, which a lot of people, I, I think more than not, will say that it was kind of formative to who he became and how he was king. Really important for his time in Thebes was his mentor, Epaminondas, uh, and his friend slash possible lover, Pelopidas. Uh, these two names, if you're familiar with the fall of Sparta, uh, should pop out to you. Epaminondas was the man responsible for Thebes' victory at Leuctra, and which was essentially uh, a crushing defeat of what was left of the Spartan elite. But still managed to get killed by them yeah. when he tried to take Sparta. Yeah, and uh, uh, Pelopidas was the leader of the Theban sacred band, uh, which will come up again. And he also had another relationship with another advocate for the sacred band, and uh, Paminos uh, was another man. But I mean, in this time, he learned military strategy from arguably the best generals of the time. Right. He was thoroughly Hellenized Very much so. in this process. He received a Greek education, and he would take this to the north, this... and, and he would use this. This is not the last time this will happen. Uh, the same we'll, we'll see again in the future with both Germanic people. Uh, Arminius was a taught in Rome, and I believe it was also the Huns who, uh, whose leaders had a brief education yeah. in uh, an imperial city. Yeah, these sorts of things. They're not, it's not a unique circumstance by any means, um, but very formative to Philip as a person. Yes. Uh, he, he was returned to Macedon in 364, where he came into a situation eventually that both of his brothers were dead, which left him in a spot. He was the eldest of the sons, but he still wasn't the successor. Uh, he had a nephew named Amintas IV, uh, 
359, he became his official regent, and in the same year, he became the king of Macedon. So he he took that. Uh, he was never meant to be king, but he became king anyway, uh, by virtue of you know his his personal authority and skill. I like think makes right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, the interesting thing about this is that he never actually killed Amintas the Fourth. Um, that didn't happen until Alexander. So I, he clearly didn't feel threatened by his nephew. Uh, I mean, Philip's just a powerful man who was not afraid he took the reins and he held them and he wasn't gonna let anyone take them from him and he showed that throughout his entire military career um he was a man who was you know a uniter uh, he was a conqueror but he was politically smart as well he was the full package i mean this comes up a lot people are debating who was better alexander or philip and yeah I, they're a dyad they're it, it's hard to compare them they both did amazing things that so few people in history have done, or could do, for that matter. Yeah. Uh, but Philip really was, you know, this great king in the one on the Persian sense. The one's <laughs> legacy was secured by the other. Exactly. Uh, without Philip, Alexander wouldn't have been able to have done what he did. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I and very much first. Uh, yeah. If Alexander didn't do what he did, we wouldn't be talking about Philip. Today. Exactly. He'd just be uh, another king. So. Philip's job now was to figure out how to expand Macedon. Um, so he, he took the war to the people around him, his borders. He had to secure them. Uh, he started conquering uh, the Paeonians. How did he muster troops? So Philip, as part of his Greek education, learned a Greek warfare system. Uh, and he reformed the Macedonian military uh, to institute full-time soldiers. Uh, the most famous of his military reforms was the Sarissa. Every hoplite in Greek tradition carried a long spear uh, like six around six to eight feet, I think, is the length of a, a typical hop, uh, hoplite spear. Uh, the Sarissa was 16 feet long. Yeah. They, didn't, uh, they wouldn't carry a shield. They wouldn't carry a big shield. Yes. Uh, not a hoplon, no. like a hoplite would. Uh, they carried smaller shields, but with these huge spears that were more or less an equivalent to like a medieval pike. Uh, rather than you know what you might think of when you think of a stabbing spear, uh, they could dominate a battlefield. They were um, slow, and they slow, were, but twice so the reach. So you needed something. You needed an advantage that most um, people of mainland Greece could not have due to their mountainous area with low food supplies mm -hmm. and relative poverty. Um, horses. The 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 basic phalanx is very immobile, and the Macedonian one is even slower. Yeah, and but, it moves in a wedge, right? Uh, it can it can move in a straight. Yeah, it, it can do a it similar is, formation to um, the hoplite. And it's fairly versatile, too. Um, it, it was something important. Philip dra trained his troops. Uh, he drilled them so that they would be prepared to move quickly. Uh, I mean, they were a huge innovation. And, it, and again, it was another reason that Alexander was able to get so much done is because of Philip's military reforms, which but, made them such a successful aggressor. It really <coughs> relied on the cavalry. Um, yeah. People always talk about the Sarissa, but um, this was the huge advantage. Um, it, it was. It, while this thing might be versatile, it was slow. It, it, it could not pursue. If the various other, let's say, uh, auxiliaries and such that, the, uh, that Philip innovated were lacking, it was just a bunch of spearmen out in the middle of nowhere, stranded. And mm -hmm. We'll see that when we get to Pydna. The, uh, the cavalry was a huge part of uh, Macedonian... The Macedonian formations, uh, and I mean, we'll see that soon. I'll talk more specifically about it when we get a little Kyrie, further down. Yeah, yeah and uh, but I, it, it was the bread and butter of the upper class Macedonians participating in the military was to be able to be a part of the bodyguards, the Symphophulakes, I believe it's pronounced. Uh, so be a part of the bodyguards um, or to join the companion cavalry. Uh, as it was called, the Hetairoi, one of the divisions of uh, the Macedonian military. Not to be mistaken with Hetairai. Yeah. Oh, it's yes. Not the Hetairai, yes. the Hetairoi. That's where I'd like to be assigned. <laughs> uh, Philip, having conquered, I mean, in his time, as a side note, he took multiple wives. Uh, he was into polygamy. Uh, they were all political marriages. And, yes. and like I said, he was a very adept political maneuverer. Uh, he did not marry these women necessarily out of love. Uh, I, there's a story about one where he may have, um, but 
uh, a lot of these were politically it's driven. Worth noting, uh, the historians don't see him as a polygamist. They uh, say that he uh, dismisses the previous one, <laughs> as uh, so it's as if he's divorcing them. Mm. Where that's not the picture you should take. That's no. a very Greek-centered view of an of a more polygamist Macedonian society. Yeah, and I mean, we see this, the importance, he didn't have a lot of children, uh, I mean, at, he had at least one daughter, Cleopatra, uh, I'm fairly certain he had more than just two, but Cleopatra and his son Alexander the Third, um, who would become our important Alexander, eventually, um, he was his only son, I believe. Alexander the Important. Alexander the Important. <laughs> Alexander the All Right. Um, but yeah, political marriage, it was one of the ways that he secured relationships throughout the Mediterranean, uh, without having to bloody his army. Uh, I think his army put up enough of a threat at times, even that, that kind of helped, but there were a lot of places, uh, for example, Epirus, uh, which is where Olympias is from, and Olympias being Alexander III's mother, uh, it was one of the ways he secured a relationship with Alexander of Epirus. Um, uh, the, the Epirotes, um... What were they exactly? I really don't know anything about them. Uh, it was a smaller kingdom on the Adriatic. So th uh, would they be closely related to Greeks? Would they be more like Illyrian? Uh, were they like Hellenized? Somewhere like the in the middle. I, I think they were somewhat Hellenized. Because um, I know there's Pyrrhus who's That's Greek. only a few hundred. A few hundred. Yeah, 100 years away. Less than that even. Yeah, he's, he's 270s. Yeah, 280s um, and... But we could say that's also a result of Macedonian expansion and Hellenism. Yeah. Um, it, it's hard to say. I, I personally don't know a lot about the Epirates I, themselves. Yeah. Uh, they must have been somewhat Greek, at least closely related to the Macedonians. They were not far away. They were a border kingdom that had had relations with the Macedonians before through their respective royalties. And now we see it again with Olympias. Uh, who Angelina thinks was Russian. Right. And for yeah. those wondering, this is in modern-day Croatia. Yeah, modern-day Croatia. So, Upper Adriatic on the Greek side. It's worth noting that Ennius, the Roman poet of the 3rd century, calls him Boros, which would be uh, a more Macedonian form that you'd expect for fiery. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just wonder if how Greek or how uh, Macedonian he might have been because I'm betting closely related to both of those. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just not sure personally. Yeah. Uh, something someone must know. Oh, I'm <laughs> just, sure. Just not me. Yeah. There's been a PhD on the PhD on the PhD that, um, crack that shell. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, really no doubt. Enlightening information. Yes. So, um, a couple of the major engagement that Phillips take place in that really helps him solidify southern Greece, quote unquote, southern Greece, so everything south of Macedonia, um, are the sacred wars. Um, the sacred wars take place mainly surrounding Delphi. Um, and focus. And, well, focus is the agitator. Uh, Delphi is the reason. Um, what we have is the Amphictyonic Council, uh, which is the council of states which formed a group in order to maintain Delphi. The Phocians liked to poke around. Uh, they liked to cause problems. Uh, the Third Sacred War, which started around 356, uh, Philip was asked by the Thessalians to intervene um, against a bunch of issues that were happening. This gave him a good excuse to first inject himself into Greece. He marched south. Uh, we have them fighting the Phocians. What did they do? Is, this is the time that they looted... Is this the time they looted De Delphi, and then used all the money looted there from to buy enough mercenaries to defend themselves for looting Delphi? Or is that the first or second one? Because oh, that was a good oh, one. That's a brilliant investment. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a story and a half. Uh, how does this one start? It's a Game of Thrones season. It's the Phocians. So, the Third Sacred War, in which Philip invaded Thessaly, um, he was fighting against the Pharaons, uh, the Phocians, Ochomachus was the uh, general that he fought. Uh, the major culminating battle was the Battle of Crocus Fields, 
only the summer before, so 356, he had marched south and he'd been defeated twice by the Thessalians uh, and their group uh, soundly. Uh, he marched back north, but the returning summer, uh, he came back, he fought them again in the Battle of Crocus Fields, like I just said, um, where he was victorious. Uh, he had 25,000-ish troops, I believe, with him, uh, 20,000 infantry, 5,000 horse. Um, just, it's worth noting that... It, in the 15th century, that those are the type of troops that the King of France would be... Yeah, to put a scale on thing. Yeah, yes. exactly. Um, this was a lot. I mean, again, Macedon, Macedonia is a small country, um, very mountainous like the rest of Greece. Um, so these are the sorts of things we're looking at. Uh, Philip might have marched further south during that campaign if the Athenians had not taken up guard at the Pass of Thermopylae. Uh, they, fearing retaliation from Philip moving south, uh, set themselves up there in order that they could stop that. And I mean, we look back to the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, we can look forward to different battles of Thermopylae as well, all the way up to the World Wars. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's an important pass, uh, which hindered Philip, he didn't make any moves southwards. Uh, these are more complex has, events that I'm making them seem right now. Has anyone ever successfully defended the pass of Thermopylae? I know both the pre-Roman ones were lost. Well, the Romans took Thermopylae. Arguably, the Athenians did here. Like They didn't actually engage in conflict, but they deterred him back. Oh, but they never... Yeah, I guess. Yeah. That, that's a victory! I mean, Antiochus loses there in 190s. But he uh, was he was trying to hold it. That's what I mean. He's trying to hold it. Yeah, he lost. Yeah, does anyone actually successfully hold it? Uh, I don't know the results of the World War II. Oh, uh, the Nazis battle. took it. Oh, there you go. In World War II. In any case, <laughs> I... The they lost a few men, but, you know, by the time you have bombers, narrow ground just makes you a little bit more of a target. Yeah, it makes it tough. Um... So anyway, the, the Third Sacred War is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, all of the Sacred Wars are fairly complex geopolitical situations that are worth looking further into. But this, uh, you know, puts Philip back. It puts him on the map of Greece. Uh, he's recognized kind of as a leader of Greece, uh, which I'll play more in the Fourth Sacred War. Of all of Greece, by this point. Um, not yet, yeah, not the entirety of Greece. Uh, we see Thessaly looking northward. He's just a major power player. Yeah. He's, he's like the hegemon. He's, he's, a... he's the hegemon. Uh, there's a certain type of archon he's named of Thessaly eventually. Not yeah. yet, but... I mean, this is his entrance kind of he's, onto the Greek, quote-unquote, international where stage. He, where he doesn't have to have direct influence, he is feared. Um, the Spartans and the Athenians and the Corinthians, really, and the Thebans, all start to very, very much fear him. Right. And as the good Machiavelli has told us, it is better to be feared than loved. <laughs> and not when fear leads to al alliances against you. Right. It depends on the type of fear. A fear of what you could uh, be. I mean, in any case, uh, uh, in the intermediate... In Intermediary. In, the, in the intermediary period, after the Third Sacred War, uh, Philip did not rest. I mean, he had to maintain his kingdom. He kept fighting battles. Uh, he, oh, he controlled Fair Eye after the Third Sacred War. He attempted some sieges, uh, which included the Siege of Byzantium, which was unsuccessful. Which, let's not go crazy here. Let's it not was, go crazy. It's not a big deal. <laughs> not a big deal. Large, fortified oh, it's, Greek it's city. It's a fairly big deal. It's trade from the... It's the grain route to the Black Sea for the Athenians, which is always a point of contention. I mean, he had other dealings with the Athenians as well, over Amphipolis, uh, which the Athenians did not, like, not having. Um, and they made a deal uh, for access to the mines. And I mean, that's another huge thing of Philip's reigns. Oh, Lorion? Uh, no, Lorien's uh, in Attica. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. Sure. The mines of uh, the Amphipolis area around Philippi, which, of course, Philip named after himself, uh, which was also surrounded by uh, mines, and all this wealth coming into Macedon was certainly a factor of their success. Um, we have the famous missive to the Spartans, uh, because, you know, eventually, uh, a little later on, he does march southward, and he says to the Spartans, if I bring an, uh, an army into the Peloponnese, you know, I'll burn your farms, and I'll raise your houses, and I'll murder your women, or something along those lines. I don't remember the quote exactly. And the Spartans send back, if. The letter just said, if? If. Yeah, nice. if I come into your territory, and they just say. But it wasn't so much to say you can't get in, it's just to say, 
you can't. Ha you don't have anything to spare to destroy some people. But I mean, it worked. Philip was just all respect for that. He's just like, no, no, thank you. I'm cool. He um, didn't want to invest himself in anything more. Well, I mean, and yeah. They and, bluff. and at this time, this was a little later on. This is when he controlled most of Brees already. But um, he was busy with other planets. He was busy and with North other things. Was always the and Illyrians. Tumultuous area. Um, a lot of the quote unquote barbarous, barbarian tribes of the North. Uh, were always an issue for the Macedonians. It was a constant battle. Thracians were always a huge deal. Uh, to keep them in line was, you know, like half his job. Um, um, and that's what you know, it's worth noting that Romans, uh, whenever they ma made a nation to a peace treaty, as we're going to see later, they told the Carthaginians that they could not wage any war without the Romans' permission. Mm -hmm. um, the Macedonians were told that they could not wage any offensive war without the Romans' permission. Yeah. There was this understanding. You're on the frontier. Against yeah, and that was that's Philip V and Perseus that yeah. we're talking about here, which is... But the point yeah. stands that there's always an understanding that the Macedonians have to be in arms. To yes. Agree. So, after all of that, uh, we have the Fourth Sacred War, which begins, you know, around 339. In 346, uh, Philip's asked to lead the Amphictyonic Council. So, once again, that's the council in charge of Delphi. Uh, he, he leads it uh, because he already controls Thessaly uh, by proxy. He has two votes, which makes him a huge member of the Amphictyonic Council. The Fourth Sacred War is sparked again by the Phocians starting to cultivate land in the uh, Crisian Plain right below Delphi, uh, land that's sacred to Apollo, so you don't plow that. The Amphictyonic Council is not happy about it. The war is brief for them anyway. Um, what we have is the Athenians and the Thebans very afraid of the Macedonians, however. They start to march southward, which puts the Athenians in a panic because they're currently at war with them uh, as an ally of focus. Uh, we have the famous Philippics by Demosthenes at this time against Philip and his reign. He really hated him. Uh, we also have Demosthenes urging the Athenians to make an alliance with the Thebans against Macedonia. Uh, and this is where we come to. They decide this is a good plan of action. The uh, Thebans agree. Demosthenes is a, a famous rhetorician who is known to uh, practice by going down by the water and filling his mouth with rocks. We have the aggression of Thebes that also plays a part in this. Uh, in the same year, 339, Thebes takes Nicaea. Uh, which had been garrisoned by the Macedonians, so obviously... Nice. They had Nicaea, huh? Yeah. Oh, I did not um, know that. Nicaea's in uh, Anatolia, so I didn't know they were that far already. No, different Nicaea. Oh, different Nicaea? Different Nicaea. Is it spelled differently, um, The too? ocean Nicaea. No, same thing. All right. It just means victory. I mean, it's a yeah. pretty common name. Uh, good place to give a new, a new colony. So, <laughs> the Thebans had taken Nicaea, which the Macedonians had previously uh, held ties to, which they did not like. Uh, so this is Thebes' impetus to ally with Athens against this huge force. Uh, and this all results in one of my favorite parts of all of history is the Battle of Chironia in 338. Um, it's a spectacularly huge battle, roughly 35,000 troops on either side. And uh, on one side we have the Macedonians under Philip controlling the infantry, uh, and on the other wing is uh, an 18 year old Alexander III, his son, commanding the companion cavalry in one of his first engagements, uh, which is going to be huge. I mean, this is his trademark. Yes, um, if anyone thinks Alexander the Great's a military genius, he did what his father instructed this battle, not only in this battle, but in every battle of his career. Um, so he, he just did what dad taught him. Yeah, I mean, that's. Arguably, I mean, he never lost a battle. I know, I'm just trying to point out that <laughs> perhaps more credit should be given to the guy who devised it. Oh, no it. doubt. I mean, you always credit your teachers, right? Um, so we have this battle, the Thebans and the Athenians. Uh, the Athenians are opposed to the infantry under Philip, and the Thebans are opposed to the companion cavalry against Alexander, and the far most of the Theban wing is the sacred band. Uh, now, the sacred band, I think we may have mentioned last time, was the 150 pairs of lovers, the elite military unit of the Thebans. So, Chironia is a very small town 
uh, in Boeotia, uh, somewhere between Delphi and Thebes. Uh, I was there last summer. Small, small town, uh, somewhere between Delphi, Athens, and Thebes. Uh, it's where the Theban and the Athenian alliance rushed to meet Philip. Uh, I was there last summer. Uh, it's a huge valley um, covered by mountains on one side. You can you can see where the battle lines were because the sacred bands position the line is marked by the line monument uh, and the far left of the Macedonian line is marked by the Macedonian Barrow Mound which is a, an inconspicuous little hill in the middle of a field that you wouldn't know was anything otherwise. They excavated it, they found spears and armor and bones buried beneath it. Um, yes, it's worth noting in ancient warfare if you can turn the tide of battle quickly, you can win with few casualties. Yeah. So um, some of Sulla's victories, if we're, we're to trust, um, what's his name, uh, Eutropius, which we maybe shouldn't, um, <laughs> he has like four dead among the Roman legionnaires themselves fighting Mithridates. But, I mean, that's a little ridiculous, but yeah. if you can turn, a battle's not just 30% dead on one side, it's something like, 3% on one side and like 40 on another if, if it's a major defeat. Yeah, and uh, I mean this this battle, the Battle of Chironia like any other of Philip's battles was won based on a, an amazing strategy. Uh, nothing complex though. Uh, what they did was called a wheeling maneuver. Uh, Philip's side of the line, the infantry feigned a retreat and they tricked the Athenians into chasing them which broke the line. Uh, at the same time, Philip's half of the line pulled back, Alexander's half pushed forward into the Thebans, uh, and being exposed on both sides because the Athenians had fallen for the trick, uh, the Thebans were crushed. Uh, it was the end of the sacred band, uh, that's why the Lion Monument marks their burial place, um, which is still below the monument today. Uh, it was excavated, um, they found... 200 and something pair, or 200 and something different bodies. Not a full 300, but they're fairly confident still that it is the sacred band. All of them might, not all of them may have died. Yeah, it's very true, but it was the end of the sacred band yes, as, as a group, maybe not their literal end. Well, um, and again, it may have been after the battle because mm -hmm. what happened to Thebes, but we'll get to that. Oh, it's worth noting, actually, in this battle, I forget what source I read this in, it could just be apocryphal it might not actually be true but it's said that um, among the Athenians the first to drop his shield was Demosthenes <laughs> nice it's worth I, I we should you should look that up after this see what it's based on if anything because I love that story and I hope it's true <laughs> yeah so I mean that's Chironia, that's, that's the consolidation of even further southern Greece, uh, barring the Peloponnese, as we said, the Spartans didn't submit, and uh, at that time they didn't push for it, uh, but Athens was taken, um, they were very good to Athens, actually. They were very generous. Very generous uh, in the war indemnities, and Pindar. almost nothing. Um, that's like Alexander burnt Thebes, oh, yeah, not right. Philip. Yes, sir. Um, so... Uh, it, this isn't the end of Philip. Uh, Philip lives for another two years. Uh, he's assassinated at a wedding by Pausanias, one of his bodyguards. Uh, a famous Pausanias, not not Sparta's Pausanias. Or the writer. Or the writer. Uh, but a Pausanias uh, stabs him in 336. Yeah. Um, gets, gets captured and killed. Gets captured and killed. He tries to run away. He's caught. Uh, and Alexander in 336 is named the king. Yes. Uh, so this is the start of Alexander's portion. Can we get into conspiracy theories? Because I love conspiracy theories. And this uh, is a good time for We can talk briefly about conspiracy theories because, I mean... Sure, by all means. Alexander, uh, you know, one of the theories is that Alexander set him up to be killed. Um, you know, mm. we can't say about that. The old know, well, there was some friction in the family. Friction, yeah. Uh, his mother's was no longer the... Like the top the woman yeah. of the uh, the old Freudian conspiracy. Olympias uh, was pushed aside for a new wife. Uh, the marriage. Um, so I mean, Alexander, in revenge, has him murdered by Pausanias, who he paid to do this deed. He doesn't want um, another child being born. Who no other children. Yeah, no, no claimant. No competitors or claimants. Uh, I mean, it's worth noting that as soon as Alexander, like I said earlier, was became king, 
Uh, he killed Amintas the Fourth, his cousin, uh, who was as his custom, as his custom, as his tradition, uh, because he had a stronger claim than Alexander did to the throne because Philip had stolen the throne from him. Uh, so he's dead now. Uh, Alexander goes on a spree and kills anyone who might have any claim. Yep. Uh, he kills a few of um, those who were present at the wedding, blaming them for setting up the murder, with the notable example, example of Alexander of Lancastis, uh, who was a cousin uh, who he spared because he immediately started praising him as the king of Sparta, or as the king of Macedon, not Sparta. Um, the king is dead. The Long is the dead. king. Long, exactly, and that's the only reason that uh, Alexander of Lancaster and his father were not killed. Uh, he survives right until the death of Alexander, too. So, um, you know, he, he immediately sets to weeding out any competition, which may be indicative of his ambition to have already killed Philip, but I, I'm not sure. So let's talk about uh, his early years. I mean, everything up until this point. Well, up until this point, until the age of 16, he was tutored by Aristotle. Uh, that was a conscious effort by Philip to Hellenize the court of Pella. So we see a lot of art at this time moving northward uh, and philosophy, Aristotle. So, I mean, Alexander, because of his education, uh, for whatever other reasons, he was a large fan of um, Homer's work. Uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey he carried right, he a copy could with quote him. extensive passages he, of it but yeah. so could everyone at the time yeah, any educated man but he yeah. was you know uh, an educated man Alexander as a youth had been brought up in the page system uh, which we'll talk a little bit about for a conspiracy later uh, the pages were essentially all the royal children going through a type of school together where they'd learn you know martial arts uh, literature those sorts of things they were bound to the king and the king's successor and they were under full control of that king so it kind of a way to keep all the different houses of macedonia in line um and this is where a lot of the important players in alexander's life come from uh ptolemy was also a member of his group hephaestion um, right aristotle also tutored ptolemy yeah yeah exactly so he came up in a cohort which we really see among his uh ptolemy friends the and king leaders. not the astronomer yeah ptolemy the king not <laughs> not the later astronomer right um so that's his life i mean he's been educated well uh he was at the battle of chironia so he's seen military action extensively up to this point and he's ready to be king uh there's also the question of how he becomes king one of the myths, or I mean, if you believe it's true, one of the important things to note about Macedonian society is the role of the army and, and the so-called army assembly. Uh, I did a little bit of work on this last semester. Um, some of our earlier sources claim that the army elected the king, that the army only gave power by consent. Realistically, there's no proof for this. Um, I mean, that that side argues that the army body, or the army assembly, as it's often called, has a certain constitutional right, a certain judicial right, uh, which doesn't, to me at least, appear to exist. I mean, you can read articles by Edward Anson or Malcolm Arrington, which will argue the same thing I'm arguing right now, is that the army, you know, they could shout and yell, uh, but they never actually had any power. And such is the case with the succession of Alexander we see the people at Pella uh, during during that time acclaiming him king, uh, whether or not that was factual, is that had to happen, or if it was ceremonial, or if it's just an invention, uh, we can't say. I, I mean, it's impossible to say because we don't know a lot about... Um, Macedonian custom. Yeah, Macedonian custom. They didn't have a formal constitution. They didn't have a written constitution. Oh, well, yeah, but they... They're a kingship. Uh, they're, they're a... They had rules not necessarily for sure. for these yeah i mean we don't we just don't know about these things that's the fact i mean we have no writings about it uh we have from aristotle's politics uh a little bit about kingship from his sections on kingship we can maybe glean a little from that seeing as he had an inside perspective of the macedonian court uh but he doesn't say anything specifically he talks specifically about spartan kings about these kings uh, he talks about the importance of a king as a general, but not really specifics of the Macedonian court itself. So, right. In either case, Alexander became the king. And 
as the king, I mean, as all your rivals are wont to do, as soon as you have some weakness, they pounce. Um, so Alexander's first actions were to defend his kingdom, you know, fight back the Thracians and uh, the Paeonians, uh, all of the people from the north. Uh, he had to reconsolidate everything, uh, which took time. But uh, thankfully there was a bit of an army that had already been marshaled. Yes, he did have veterans. Because... His father was preparing a campaign. Yes, his father had been, before his death, elected to be the hegemon, the leader of a campaign against Persia, uh, concocted as a retaliation for the Persian Wars a hundred years before, uh, if not more, a hundred years. Uh, by this time, hundred. Well, a retaliation for right. what happened, not just in the Persian Wars, but, but everything since, like, the Peloponnesian War. Yes, exactly. So and now let's remember uh, a little bit of context that Persia is still, at this time, the mega power. Yes. They yes, own um, Egypt. Um, uh, they own the Levant. They had a very... Yes, their previous ruler actually was really good at re-capturing uh, places like Egypt and... Uh, they had the Ionian coast. Yeah, yep. taking stuff back that previous rulers have had let slip. Um, Darius, however, was is rather young and untested. This is Darius the third. Yes. we're talking about. So Darius the first was responsible for the battle at Marathon. Darius the second was a. Darius the second ruled around the four twenties, I believe, yep. during the early stages of the Peloponnesian War. Yes, yes, um, um, that's right. Because when he died, that's the, that's the Darius that died for the beginning of Xenophon's Anabasis. Yes. So, um, so this is what we're seeing. Uh, we have Greek aggression against the Persians. Uh, so this this responsibility, although he's not able to go at it right away because he's so busy consolidating his rule at home. Alexander is consciously preparing to um, embark against the Persians with the Greek forces, Macedonian forces. Um, so, Alexander himself is awarded with the generalship of Greece, uh, that position that we talked about just a second ago, Philip having attained. Um, in 334, his campaign starts. So he's consolidated his rule. He's marched south into Greece. Uh, this is the time when he burns Thebes, except for Pindar's house. Uh, he loved Pindar. <laughs> that's everything. Everyone in Thebes. did. Yeah, that's the report. Everything in Thebes was burned, except for the house of Pindar. Pindar is a famous and, poet, for those who don't know. Yeah, a famous elegiac poet. Very difficult. Um, writing. From hundreds of years prior. Hundreds of years prior, yes. Uh, like, like he was, what, 6th century or yeah. something? Yeah. Uh, Maybe. Pindar, as you might have picked up, was a Theban. His house was a monument in Thebes, uh, and that is what was not burned. So I've also been to Thebes. I don't recommend it. Uh, the house the, isn't there. there. There's no house. There's a plaque and a little parquette. Which you really is, don't recommend it. I don't recommend Thebes at all. What, what were you just saying? A dead dog was more interesting. <laughs> yeah. A dead dog in Thebes was more interesting than Better that. Uh, I, I mean, it depends what you go for. Um, the entire Cadmea, which is the Acropolis of Thebes, is covered by modern city. Uh, you can see bits of Byzantine fortifications as you walk up and down the streets. Uh, it was a lot of mess and but that's that's my personal opinion. Thebes is there are other places. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if you live there. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think I don't think I have to worry about you <laughs> Three no. months later assassinated by Greek by a Theban. <laughs> yeah, by the Golden Dawn and not oh, the magical kind. I live with him. I live in Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> Hartford, are... Connecticut. And I, his roommate, live in Hartford. Also Hartford, <laughs> Connecticut. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh... Thank you for coming to Hartford this weekend, Dan. Oh, you're welcome. You know, I make the trip every week. So, um... Yeah, so 334, the campaign begins. Uh, Alexander starts his march that would last until his death uh, over ten years, uh, which is extraordinary. And I mean that wears on his troops eventually, as we'll see. Uh, but... You know, he crosses the Hellespont. Uh, immediately, he's like, he's into battles, uh, the Battle of Granicus, uh, in which he is able to secure Sardis. Uh, he cuts down the Ionian coast, uh, quote-unquote, freeing the cities uh, um, from Persian oppression. This is what most scholars think um, Philip's intent was. Not to keep going, to retake the Greek. Yes, just and the Greek. This would have been Philip's intent, everyone thinks. This is Alexander's ambition that's pushing him further. We have 
also this time the the famous to Alexander episode of the Gordian Knot. Right. Uh, so the Gordian Knot was a mass of ropes hung up in Gordian or Gordium, depending on which. So well, the Gordian Knot. The yeah. myth was that whoever could untie uh, the Gordian Knot would be the king of Asia. Uh, Alexander, being clever as he was, just cut it. Yeah, he just takes the sword and he just hacks through it. it. And I, whether or not the story is true, is kind of a moot point. It's how he's been mythologized, but it, it's paintings re- about it. Really, it's really indicative of the type of character that he's always portrayed as, kind of, you know, by might. You know, he'll cut through anything yeah, to get to and his outside goal. the box thinker. Yeah, that as well. I mean, that's... Get out of my son. <laughs> <laughs> a few of the things he's known for is his strateg- uh, strategy, his uh, military prowess, and his temper. Um, and drinking. And drinking. He was also good at drinking and pouting. Um, he pouts drinking a few times. is a yeah. good masculine um, tradition. Brett but, just reminded me of one of my favorite Alexander anecdotes. And uh, that's when he was marching around and uh, he came across... The good Diogenes, the cynic, <laughs> uh, sleeping in his, uh, well, I guess sunbathing in his... His, uh, his barrel bathtub. His, his barrel, well, it wasn't a barrel, they didn't have barrels yet. They had giant amphorae. Yeah. So he's in one of these giant amphorae, and uh, Alexander kind of like walks up to the mouth of his amphora, and he says, Oh, great Diogenes, your wisdom is, you know, untold. I am king of all these lands, and I will grant you whatever you you desire. Just please tell me what you want. And Diogenes just looks up, and he says, Get out of my sun. <laughs> yeah, in his, looking up in his shadow. <laughs> Feral kid. There's a lot of good paintings of that, too. Yeah, good uh, episode. Actually, the uh, Acropolis Museum in Athens has an entire Lego set of the Acropolis that they've built. With all these little things, and one of the little things on the Acropolis is Diogenes and Alexander and Lego. Is he masturbating? <laughs> <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> he was the G.G. Allen of his time. <laughs> there you go. So he's cutting down the Ionian coast. Uh, he's taken Halicarnassus, he's taken Cardia, and he's moving towards Syria and the Levant. Uh, and this is at the time when he meets with Darius, uh, Darius III, who we mentioned briefly. Uh, at the Battle of Issus. Uh, this is 333 now, so within the next year after he's set out. Uh, this is the one, whenever you see a picture of Alexander in battle on his horse, uh, and some scared looking dude on a chariot, that's yeah, Darius. A famous fresco. Very famous fresco from Pompeii. Uh, it's in all the museums. I mean, if you Google uh, Alexander the Great right now, 10 to 1 says it comes up in the images. Yeah, probably. Um, this is that battle. Uh, he defeats. Darius so badly. Uh, Darius flees. Uh, he leaves behind his daughters and his wife and his mother. Uh, that's how hurried he is. Uh, Alexander. Uh, Shameful. Shame <laughs> on you. Your mother, she is ashamed of you for forever. Yeah. All um, through the annals of history. Alexander treated her well. Alexander, yes. Alexander treated gentleman. them all very well. He wants um, to be a king. Alexander's goal, yes, is to become... Uh, the king of kings. The, he wants, yeah. The, what, Shah Rasha. Shah Rasha, yeah, that's the term I'm looking for. Yes, so, uh, so what does he do? legitimized in the eyes of the previous. He treats them, yeah, he treats them like the royalty they are. He he puts them back, he has them live in comfort, he takes them back to where they're from when conquers it, uh, and they're treated very well. Um, so, no concern there, but I, it's a funny episode, he leaves his mom, as far as he knows, to die, um, which is always nice. Well, um, that might have uh, been the silver lining. We don't know how... Darius, you bastard! You left me behind! I'm gonna kick your ass, you little fuck! Sorry, punk. Mom, I just, uh... You know, uh... Tempest Fugit, as do I. <laughs> yeah, so, um... I mean, Alexander, obviously, he keeps going. Uh, he's on the offensive now, right into the heart of Persian territory, moving south uh, into Syrian Levant, uh, you know, multiple sieges, including the very famous and very These are probably siege. the richest cities. Yo, oh, yeah, the Phoenician, the old Phoenician trading cities. Uh, treasuries. Every, uh, every satrapy, oh. starting with Sardis, we have a treasury. <laughs> treasuries everywhere. I live Susa, he's going to tell you eventually. Um, and the Persians, for all of this decadence they're told to ha- or they're said to have, were actually quite sparing with their treasuries. They yeah. had plenty of surpluses. Yeah. 
so I was just mentioning one of the most famous sieges of all of Alexander's career was the siege of Tyre. Yeah. Uh, Tyre was isolated. Part of the city was like isolated. An island or a yeah, it, it, was, an, it was an island it, fortress. It, it literally was, was an, an island. island fortress, and Alexander could not figure out how to um, disembark to or... get over there. He had to get a, a fleet in. Um, no. So his his solution in the end uh, was to permanently change the landscape of the area by building a mole. Yeah, a giant mole. rampart from land to island. Yeah, they piled up dirt and debris all the way across so he could march his army into the city, uh, which is amazing. You can see if you go on Google Maps again and you look at the city, where the city of Tyre is, you can see the mole that he built. It's still there. That's fucking crazy. It's great. It's great. He literally changed the face of the earth to get to his goal. That's how driven and determined and historiography, was. the ancients love talking about this stuff. Whether it was um, with Hannibal coming up, just carving a path through the Alps, but the kind of hubristic uh, uh, protagonist uh, role is this guy who will conquer nature to get his way. Caesar yeah. in um, Luke. Yeah. There's Ex another instance of this in, in prehistory. We don't We have no idea when it happened, but it's written in the like Indian sacred texts. And there's a, a like a land, an underwater land bridge from Sri Lanka to India, mm. and you can see it on Google Maps, and it's crazy. Yeah, and we have no idea when it was made, or but we know that it's written about, which is interesting. Yeah, so um, it's it's around this time too, around the time he conquers uh, Tyre, that Alexander names himself the King of Asia. Uh, so I mean, a huge step up, you know, King of Macedon, King of Asia. Right. And I, I think it's mentioned worth to mention at this time too that. In his absence, Alexander has left Antipater as um, his governor back home in Macedonia. Uh, so that's not, not necessarily important information now, but it will be in future parts where we talk about succession. Al Antipater's going to come up again. Yeah. Uh, but just a quick note there. And, and also, let's not forget, when Alexander is calling himself King of Asia... Uh, he's calling himself King of Anatolia, which means Asia. Yeah, this is Asia Minor. Yeah, um, but it's just Anatolia means Asia is Asia in yeah. Greek. And so that's that's a portion, you know. Yeah, uh, again, it's named after the uh, a small town of like Asse or something. So the around sur area surrounding it was Ga Gay Asia, the land of uh, the town. Yeah. Then just like um, Greeks became known at, by these. Gryoi, these people who live near Rome. Yeah. So too did. Uh, it's a common feature. I mean, I Turks. Mean, Turks to this day still call uh, Greeks by the Turkish word for Ionians. Hmm. So I mean, it's worth noting too that we we speak of Asia. Uh, the continent of Asia comes from Asia Minor, not the other way around. Yes. Uh, so the area past what is today Turkey was not Asia then. Yeah, there is an implicit Orientalism in yes. the categorization yeah. of geography. If we say, uh, if we were to say Asia now, you would think of the entire continent of Asia as we know it. Uh, it does not apply. It only applies to the area that is essentially Turkey today. Yeah. Um, so that's just a, a little note. Right. Um, and then so from here, he moves on downward through to the great uh, holy city. Into Egypt, yeah. Oh, before that. <laughs> Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, yeah. And the Jerus the, the Jews loved their uh, overlords this <laughs> time. Not Alexander. They actually resisted. Uh, I mean, who do you want to be oppressed by? It's the series of the day, right? Well, yeah. they didn't see themselves as that oppressed by the Persians. And that's no, the thing. not think... necessarily. Um, I mean, they would have had a certain extent of freedom like the Phoenicians would have. It's but... actually quite interesting that they, for the most part, who never gave, got along with any of these empires they were under, for some reason lived rather peacefully for a couple centuries under the Persians. They had very compatible religions. And I mean, it was Cyrus's grand gesture to return the uh, Jews from exile back to Jerusalem. So there was a slow trickle back. And uh, I mean, sometime later, uh, Alexander rolls around. And this would be the beginning of a very long and tortured relationship <laughs> between Judaism and he the Hellenization. Yeah. This is the Seleucids specifically that we'll get into eventually, I'm sure. Yeah, no, it, it won't be today. We can't even start to touch it today. No, um, and and that's more, you know, because that's documented uh, in, in uh, Maccabees. Yeah, the first and second Maccabees, and 
I Augustine told me there's a third Maccabees. Yeah, there is. Yes, in the Greek tradition. tradition. It's, yes, it's it written is. a few hundred years later. But, yeah. but anyway, yeah, we there's a rich tradition of the uh, the rebellion of Judas Maccabeus and and those sorts of things. But we'll come back to that another day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um. So he, yeah, he 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 liberates. Uh, not liberates. liberates. He liberates everything. In his Liberating is does. a very, very arbitrary. Um, but anyway, he's, he's, he's moving into Egypt. The other now. people, yeah, <laughs> down into Egypt. So as he's going into Egypt, we're around uh, three thirty-two, um, and he he storms through Egypt, and there he actually is seen as a liberator. Uh, the Egyptians rebelled many times against the Persians. Oh yes. yeah, it's worth we'll noting they, they were never happy under the Persians. They were never worse. So Alexander came in. He was hailed as a liberator by the Egyptians. Uh, the one of the most a- famous episodes, uh, probably the most famous episodes yeah. in his entire Egyptian campaign, was his stop at the Siwa Oasis, uh, where he consulted the Oracle there. Uh, the and, Oracle of Amon. Yeah, the Oracle of Amun, who is and, Zeus. Who is yeah. Zeus? In, um, in the if we want to use a syncretic. This is how yeah they model. they synchronize them. Uh, Zeus Amon is how he was referred. Uh, the Oracle there told him that he was a son of Zeus, uh, or of Amon, who is Zeus, uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, which is kind of the start of the Hellenistic ruler cult. Yes, uh, and the delegitim- le- delegitimization of his father. Yes, his father's line. and yeah, the understanding of himself as divine. Yeah, so a lot of really complex things come out of this that we're not going to tackle, I think. Not now, anyway. <laughs> no, we have to for this talk. Uh, there'll, there'll eventually be a Hellenistic ruler cult episode, I imagine. I don't know. Yeah, that, that sounds... That like actually sounds yeah. like it needs its own... It needs its, its own thing. Especially it's for so your complex. kind of goal. So, yeah, but divinized men is a... Uh, oh, it's huge in the Hellenistic It's a huge Everybody's new man. topic. So... There are no divine men before this point, really. Other yeah. than legendary... So, now Alexander is running around saying that he is divinity. Uh, you know, that's probably, like I said, the most important thing that comes out of the Egyptian campaign is his more-than-man image, um, which is something that a lot of people can hold on to, uh, which I think helps them in a lot of cases. Yeah, because, um, if you you know, Egypt, who... King of Egypt. Oh, the Pharaoh. Is Pharaoh. Yeah, who is uh, Pharaoh the son is of god. a god who becomes not, a god. Yeah. yeah. Th- this is not unusual. So, you know, uh, Alexander comes in, conquers Egypt. Well, I conquered Egypt. That makes me Pharaoh. I must be a god. Yeah, and I mean. I think a problem with this conversation uh, should be held for later still, but yes. it's worth. Uh, there's a huge assumption of what god means when we say god. Yeah, of course. So. Let's drop it for now and come yeah. back to it another day. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, he takes Egypt, uh, the founding of one of the most famous cities in the world, Alexandria, obviously named after himself. Yeah, he made many, many Alexandrias. Many Alexandrias, uh, around 18, I believe, in the end, uh, he founded. And that's that's in addition to the cities he founded and named after his horse, Bucephalus. Um, <laughs> he loved his horse. Who will? Boxhead? <laughs> not Boxhead. This Boxhead's is not card against here. humanity. <laughs> Uh, so, in addition to that, I mean, this is the Alexandria that everyone knows. Uh, huge trading city, huge Hellenistic port for knowledge, uh, learning. Yeah, this um, would knock out Naucratus as the main Greek uh, influence in yeah, Egypt. Because yeah. Naucratus was a, a Greek polis inside of Egypt. And after Alexandria was established, Naucratus just faded and, and yeah. into nothingness. I mean, there's there's so much to be said about Alexandria, but the history of that city itself is yeah ultimately and, complex. And I mean, Alexandria will be of very increasing importance to our, very our quickly. subjects yes. very quickly, and very probably quickly. I would say a good seventy percent of the people we're going to talk about in the in like in a span of the next four or five hundred years are going to be Alexandrian thinkers, yeah, or at least to spend a lot of time there. Right. So uh, I mean. Alexandria, apparently, uh, to some records, was designed by Alexander himself. Uh, apparently, well, we'll come to that, where he was buried after his death, but that's an episode for another day. Right. Um, so, having conquered Egypt, founded his own city, uh, done everything that 
would be expected of such a great guy. Uh, he moved back towards Mesopotamia, so we're looking at 331 now. Um, he defeated Darius uh, Darius again at Gagamela, uh, 331. Uh, another huge defeat for Darius, who once again fled uh, to Arbella. Uh, then he kept going all the way to Ekbactana, uh, which is where we'll catch up to him again. Uh, Alexander... In hot pursuit. Yeah, in hot pursuit, Alexander... Uh, captures Babylon, uh, another huge thing for him. Babylon becomes an important city in Alexander's empire, uh, especially during the transition period after his death. Uh, he captures the treasury at Susa and Persepolis, uh, huge treasuries, really big deal for Alexander. So, in how did Alexander not spread himself too thin? Was he buying mercenaries along the way? He was buying mercenaries. He had bought but from back home. Thracian or? mercenaries. He had. Um, mm. He had Greek mercenaries. Uh, they're very, very, very um, organized mil military. It must yeah. have been to be able to have so many languages. They would have had. Um, they would have had local all along the way. Uh, the logistics is insane uh, for a military of that time. Uh, from so many ethnicities yeah drink up rivers i mean it, it's amazing that's, that's like it's, something it's you not don't just think the numbers about. it's a diversity like this is not a modern time where you have a couple uh you know common languages there would have been you know persian would have been needed thracian Gre thracian ionic greek would have been a good idea then egyptian at one point that persian would have probably been a very good operational language but uh, what was one of the more? What was one of the more? The, what was the Franco lingua of the Persian Empire? Was it actually Persian or was it Median? It was Aramaic, wasn't it? No, that's just um, In that's the... just Phoenician. And... Okay. I I would be inclined to believe it'd be Persian. I, I forget if they were actually using um, I just forget if they actually used their own language or an already existing Franco lingua. I thought it was called Old Persian. Oh, oh, I know. Oh, yes. Come to think of it, they did use Persian inscriptions and all that. But yeah. But I don't know if that was the operational language. I mean, you could look at uh, Cyrus's cylinder. Yeah. Um, because I think Greek, it's... Aramaic, yeah, and Old Persian. But so I, I mean, there had to be some interlingual understanding. I know that in like the Euphrates and Tigris area, that they, they were still using Median and Babylonian. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the Persian Empire was a regional. It was split into lots of regions, which I, I imagine they would have had, like, well, let's take example for the medieval era where everyone had their Latin up here and their old French yeah. or their... it's you can't make that assumption that everyone had... Oh, I'm not making that this assumption necessarily. I, I'm just proposing a possibility um, because I, I can't say for sure either way what it was. All right. I, I just know that the Medians and the Babylonians really didn't pick up Persian. It never really picked up that much, so I don't know how much... Uh, no, having Persian would help in these little prop, these satrapies that sprung mm -hmm. up. But I guess if you had Persian and you're in the satrapy, you would get some bilingual people who are higher up because they would certainly exist. Yeah, I mean, be learning these multiple languages was there was an incentive for it. Yeah, because you would become part of the the scribal class. Yeah, and yeah. you didn't have to be toiling or fighting, which yeah. is unfortunate later on because the scribal class now belonged to the when you when it got conquered would make scribe jobs slavery in the roman empire hey greeks <coughs> made good slaves apparently yeah they did so uh having taken the treasuries at susa and persepolis uh he stopped for a while at persepolis uh, i've seen it up to half a year there um the most important event that happened there was the burning of Persepolis. Oh, the, the party hardy. Yeah, the party hardy. Um, so the city, uh, a lot of which had been kind of benefactions or good works of um, Xerxes or Cyrus the Great even. The story goes, at least in one tradition, that Greeks, uh, Macedonians, has gotten drunk and they burned it down as retribution for the burning of the Acropolis of Athens during the Persian Wars. Um, I'm not sure what yeah, happened. It, I mean, it could, have been, an could have been an accident. Um, I'm of the school that was an accident, then they claimed it was. <laughs> it's been very, very bad. Yeah. yeah. Hey, <laughs> but anyway, that's an episode that happens. Uh, Persepolis burns. And Darius is still alive. Uh, unfortunately, his soldiers are none too happy with him, and he is not alive for much longer. They kill him and leave him in a ditch, uh, which is significant. Uh, they they themselves name a successor 
who is denounced by Alexander. Alexander finds the body of Darius, uh, gets very upset, uh, probably as an a show, um, buries him with all the proper rights, and he goes on telling people that he is now the legitimate king of Persia. Right. Uh, in response to Darius having been betrayed and murdered. I believe that the man who claims himself king after Darius is an Arctic Xerxes, mm-hmm. uh, or an Arctic Byzantines. I'm not sure which of the two. Uh, he is an A name, though, who is who resists is eventually put down as well. Um, Alexander, now being the king of Persia, uh, controversially tries to institute proskinesis, which is the... Yes, let's discuss Yeah, this. the act of uh, bowing down before the king. Uh, this doesn't go well for him. The Macedonians right, don't so like it at all. so let's talk about the logistics about why you bow to a king. Mm. The, the institution began as a practical thing. If you come to a king facing the floor... You can't uh, be bearing weapons. It puts you at a disadvantage immediately when you're entering the presence of a king. Uh, Over time, you know, over centuries and millennia, this sort of behavior became translated as a a sign of respect to someone who was quasi-divine or divine. And in the Persian Empire, this was the usual. In Egypt, this was the usual. You bow in the presence of a king. Uh, Greeks, however, do not bow in the presence of a king. No, this is a no-no. And I mean, it was a completely foreign concept to the Macedonians who didn't see themselves as equals, but they were the companions of the king. They were the armies of the king. They were um, to be humiliated yeah, by the king. Yeah, they had a certain... Uh, Dignity. Certain dignity, certain camaraderie with every king the army did that they felt that it would be demeaning. If for them to have to bow, right. uh, which Alexander backs down on. He doesn't force the Macedonians to do it because they simply won't. And, you know, he sees this as an issue. Uh, if he tries to force it, they might rebel because it's, it's not the first issue that he's had with them. Uh, more will come up. Oh, wow. um, but I love 19th century English historians and all that and the view of Persians in literature because it's the cringing Persian this spineless uh, Easterner who just doesn't value himself. So it's a trope, he, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. a trope. So it's just worth noting that this is where we get the cringing Persian from. This swarthy Easterner who just is servile in his nature. That, that's a very common idea of the 19th and early 20th century. Yeah, and it survives still today, The this idea that the Westerner is free and the Easterner is oppressed. Yeah. Yes. It's very much, uh, you know, all all tied into the same discourse. And this is where this trope is really born. Right. Um, it starts a little earlier. With but, Herodotus. Yeah. But when Greeks are finally confronted with it, that's when we see a, such a strong resentment and so, rebellion from it. Yeah, so there is some initial resentment from that, uh, which is, you know, going to come to a head with the Macedonians eventually. Um, I mean, an episode... Uh, a little after this time, uh, the conspiracy of the pages. Uh, it's like I mentioned earlier, the pages are under the full authority of the king. That is the authority over life and death inclusive. Uh, Alexander felt betrayed by some pages in roughly 327, uh, which he put to death without second question or trial. Um, we get on uh, then, after that, uh, it's the first of a few episodes of Mutiny. Uh, there's another one, actually, I forget when it is, uh, to be honest. Um, someone, he kills someone offhandedly that made him angry, and everyone's really mad at him, and how does he resolve it? He goes in his tent and he pouts for days and doesn't come out until they forgive him. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's the episode, I yeah, don't know. Yeah, he, he's trying to be Achilles. Yeah, he is trying, to, exactly, he's trying to be Achilles, his he, hero. He's got Homer under his pillow. And he's trying to be a kid. So he literally locks himself in his tent, well, as much as you can lock a tent, and uh, doesn't come out until they beg him and they forgive him for killing someone. Um, so, I mean, there's an episode. I. It, it may be, uh, I'm thinking of Clytus now is the name. He He's someone who criticizes Alexander for his decisions, and Alexander kills him for the criticism. Yeah. Yes, a uh, little friend of his father. Being one of a friend, being one of the people who had saved his life at the Battle of Granicus. Um, and he was drunk. 
Oh yeah, and this very is something so. about Alexander that uh, I think it, it is often me- mentioned, but not often stressed in his decision. Like, yeah, yeah, this, that he was an so, alcoholic. He was cubs deep when he yeah. did this. So yeah, are we seeing some sort of meticulous or like rational act, or are we seeing some impassioned, angry drunk? Yeah. Was resentful of some friend of his father trying to put so, him in his place. I, I mean, you can take that as you will. I, yeah. there's, there's no way to tell for sure, obviously. We don't we don't know exactly how Alexander was or what he did, but this is what we get from sources. Right. Uh, so this is how we're reading into it. Um, yeah. It's the Alexander narrative that is... Yeah. It's, it's actually... There's, there's that underlying anti-Alexandrian uh, history that's kind of lost in our sources, but shows up here and there. And it's unfortunate that we just get so much that's celebrating Alexander, but very little of that tradition yeah. that hated him. <laughs> well, I mean, a polarizing guy, right? Yeah. Um, so, uh, his next move is to march against India. Uh, which, well, uh, Bactria first. Oh, well, Bactria, yeah. Um, which would become an interesting some of the upper bastion of Hellenized culture. That, yeah, uh, in Afghanistan. That lecture yeah. series course you gave me, and, wonderful. I mean, at that time too, it's when he takes his wife Roxanne, an Iranian princess. Yes. Uh, Roxana, if you wanna. I mean, there's a few Roxanne. other ways. Uh, but he marries her. He has his only son by her. His only legitimate son, quote unquote, um, Alexander the Fourth, uh, which becomes an important child once again. After his death, but not yet. <laughs> this should bring us to a tangent uh, about Alexander's, uh, can we say, race mixing project? Yeah, well, we'll come to that. There's a lot of heat for this. That's a uh, oh yes, especially among scholars the mass in the thirties and the forties. Oh, especially, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the first time in a classical st- concerning Alexander and race mixing. It's the first time in a paper I saw the word Hitlerian to dismiss some uh, <laughs> views. <laughs> Hitlerian. Yeah, so, um, you know, like you said, he marched against the upper satrapies, took them, uh, and made his way south into India. So um, he fought, he spent some time, a winter, fighting various clans in northern India. Uh, he crossed the Hydaspes River. Uh, this is where he very famously fought King Porus, uh, Punjab king. Um, he had a lot of respect for Porus. Uh, I believe it was here he was also shot by an arrow. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he gets hit by an arrow. I believe that's um, somewhere going back. No, it's it's there because uh, there's nothing else that happens after that, really. Okay. It, okay. it has to be there. Uh, if, if not, it's oh, yes, a little it is, before it is, that. Yes. So he fights King Porus, Porus being the elephant-taming uh, great Indian king who Alexander... After defeating him in battle, has so much respect for that he names him Satrap there. Um, if that's the fur- furthest Alexander goes, that's not just um, generosity or, uh, you know, um, mag- magnanimity. It's uh, prudence. This guy prudence, yeah. can govern this area. This guy is a competent general. Yeah. This guy knows I can whoop him. And it's because of Porus as well uh, that we start to have elephants yes. uh, as a war unit filter uh, westward. I mean, we see Indian elephants, Indian elephants, not yes, North African, African, not North African war elephants, uh, to be included in Alexander's army. And we see this again moving on with the Seleucids. The Seleucids were are eventually known for their elephant use, uh, which even after they lose them, they start elephant breeding farms. Uh, and kings like Antiochus uh, the Third is able to procure more elephants from another Indian ruler, Chandragupta. Chandragupta. Oh, that's um, yeah, Chandragupta. Chandragupta, however you want to say it. Uh, Sandra um, Kata, if you're reading Justin. Yeah, sources. this is this is the start of elephants in Hellenistic armies. Uh, like we mentioned, Another race enslaved. Yeah, so Alexander, uh, in this is uh, 326 that he fights Porus. Uh, this isn't the end of his campaign. In 324, he's at a place called Opus, uh, where his army mutinies. Alex, right. Alexander doesn't like this. They've had enough. This isn't this isn't the end though. Uh, at Opus, they rebel. Uh, Alexander upset, puts thirteen of them to death without trial. Uh, they continue again. They mutiny again. Uh, this time, they refuse to budge. Alexander goes back in his tent, locks himself in again, starts to pout. This time, not successful. Uh, this is when everything turns around. The army's had enough. I mean, they've been away, remember, from Macedon for 10 years now. They haven't been home. Uh, these are hardened veterans who have been on the move 
this entire Most of them moment. are married. Most of them are... Um, Probably have multiple wives. Multiple wives, yeah. Uh, they could have ten, like, camp followers. Uh, uh, camp followers. They're so far from Macedon that they're sick and tired of fighting. They want to go back to their homeland, uh, which is in part what happens now. Uh, Alexander marched them back through the Gedrosian Desert. It's extremely desolate land. Uh, there's nothing there. Lots of them die, actually. There's an episode where Alexander refuses water because he wants to give it to his troops instead. Um, kind of showing Alexander's care for his army. But, I mean, he loses a lot. Uh, he eventually arrives at Susa. Uh, he's back in Babylon where he spends his final years. Uh, it's during this time that someone we haven't talked about really at all, Hephaestion, uh, Alexander's closest friend and possible lover, uh, can't confirm or deny Explicit it. Explicit lover. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, probably. Um, it's probable, it's possible, but you can't confirm or deny it. There's, just, there's no... I'm of the opinion that... Yeah, I mean, that's fair. But uh, Hephaestion, the closest person to Alexander in the world, dies. Um, Hephaestion's title, actually, in the end... Uh, How does he die? He gets sick. Okay. Uh, illness. Uh, I guess that would be a common way to go. Because yeah. you're coming from Greece and you're going all the way to India. Yeah. So... Hephaestion dies, uh, Alexander is extremely upset by this. Uh, he holds funeral games for him. Uh, he plans this huge monument. Again, uh, obsessed with yeah. the Iliad. He's now, Achilles has his Patroclus. Yeah, we're looking to book 23 here of yes. the Iliad. And know. probably the in the rewriting of these stories, yeah. this was really emphasized. Oh, definitely. These themes definitely were or, inflated intentionally. Perhaps, how, perhaps even Alexander wanted to frame it. Yeah. I, no, I do. I would believe so. I think he but would have seen. We it. definitely have a narrative being played out that is um, a bit premeditated. Uh, yeah, and and I mean this takes place at Ecbatana specifically, is where Hephaestion dies. Uh, that's not the only thing that happens though. While they're back, um, one of the major things, and you've kind of mentioned this intermingling, was the mass marriage. Uh, Alexander forces up to a hundred of his generals to marry Persian or various ethnic princesses uh, in order to tie them together. His, his goal is a cultural intermingling uh, in which he feels, I think, that the empire would be able to better sustain itself yeah, as a homogenous entity. Yeah, uh, rather than... And these have been romanticized as uh, grand attempts to unite mankind. Yeah. And, but that would imply that they had thought there was really a difference in the first place. Yeah, I mean, something else we just can't know, right? And I think it's interesting, too, that uh, of all the generals he married off, only one stayed with his wife after the death of Alexander. The majority of them left. Uh, the Macedonians did not want to marry these princesses. Uh, I, I don't know how vocal they were about it, but they were not happy about it, to say the least. Were they forced to divorce their previous wives? Yes. Mm. Um, so, I mean, this is what we have ten years away from home. Nobody's happy about it, but I they do because Alexander's the king. Uh, Alexander starts giving important positions to Persians, uh, which makes the Macedonians upset. Uh, they're upset at him, but they start to beg him for forgiveness. Uh, and this is where we reach by... Uh, 323, by summer of 323, uh, we're back in Babylon. Alexander's there. Uh, he becomes extremely sick uh, and dies relatively shortly after at the age of 32, 33 on the 10th of June. Uh, that's again 323. How he died, what he died of, that's a complete mystery. Uh, Antipater did it! Yeah, we, uh, well, based on what happens, Antipater is one of the least ambitious people around. You don't, have to, you don't have to be ambitious, you could just be scared. Uh, well, Antipater shouldn't be scared, though. I mean, at this point, Alexander has sent 10,000 of his veterans homeward. So that's under Craterus, uh, another veteran uh, who becomes extremely important. So they're on the way home. Uh, he's starting to de-escalate his aggressive campaign. He's in Babylon, looking to go southward uh, into Arabia. One of the accounts says that his wine was poisoned. Uh, he had been, of course the alcoholic that he might have been was drinking. Uh, someone thinks that his wine was poisoned. Uh, oh, and sometimes wine was poisonous without even any intention yeah, of it. Yeah, I mean... They were made with all sorts of additives and uh, they had to be diluted in the right proportion. 
and you could, if you consumed too much of a certain wine, uh, die because of a high yeah. toxicity of a certain additive. Yeah, so um, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities here, not a lot of knowledge. Yeah, in Roman comedy, the stereotypical Greek drunk um, drank unmixed wine. Yeah. Like, Merum, Merum unmixed. I think Merum is mixed wine. Oh, right. Yeah, and I know Romans thought it was effeminate to mix your wine with honey. <laughs> women would do it. So the concept of girly drinks hasn't changed. Nice. It's supposed to be de bad on your taste buds. So this is kind of now set up for the next history we do, uh, successor period. Um, so where we are at Babylon, 323, Alexander's now dead, and we have a mass of people extremely concerned about the future. There's no solid leadership. Uh, Perdiccas is the last person reported to have been with Alexander. So after Alexander's death, or sorry, after Hephaestion's death, Perdiccas became the closest confidant to Alexander, uh, at which point on his deathbed, Alexander gave Perdiccas his signet ring. Uh, and the legend goes that he said uh, to the strongest, uh, which is silly, I think, because he was dying. He might not have been able to say anything. Uh, but he's still... I kind of like that. It's kind of a, it's the uh, masculine apple of discord. Yeah, and, a, and another <laughs> another theory actually says that we haven't misheard. It was to Craterus. So the, the words for strongest and Craterus are pretty similar in Greek. Um, Craterus, of course, as I mentioned, was on the way back to Macedonia with 10,000 so veterans. Be, one would be Cratero, the other would be... Uh, Cratisto. Yeah, exactly. Uh, extremely close. Uh, Craterus was as good a successor as any of them. He was a battle-hardened veteran. Uh, he's going to see lots of success still, and the rest of them are terrified of him once they learn that he may be able to strike against them. So, uh, This is, I think, where we'll leave off. Uh, an empire blind and in disarray, yeah. waiting, waiting for the successor period to start, which is in itself a huge, exciting mess. Yeah, that, thanks, Mitch. That was awesome. Well, thank you. Thanks, Brett. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs>